Hi, I'm Natasha Pulley. I'm the author of The Watchmaker of Filigree Street and this, the shiny new, The Bedlam Stacks. Um, this is a really beautiful Waterstones edition. It's got blue sprayed edges and a shiny gold cover. I urge you to come both here to Gower Street, where I'm standing now, to buy it, but also any Waterstones. This is probably everything I know about life, the universe and everything. Um, and it is a summation of everything that I know from the last seven or eight years. So, so please, please, please buy this and um, please be nice to it because these are my dreams. So, it is about a young man called Merrick Tremaine. Um, he's trapped at home with a horrible injury. Um, he's been injured in service for the East India Company, but he's nearly lost his leg. And so he can't work anymore. He's at home with his awful brother, Charles, on a crumbling estate in Cornwall. But there is a terrible malaria epidemic in India. The only known treatment at the time, and this is 1859, um, was quinine. Quinine only grew in Peru and Bolivia, way out in the jungle. It was not easily accessible, it was very expensive. And what the East India Company did was they decided, rather than buying this stuff from the Peruvian government at you know, a massive cost to the British government, they would send out an expedition to steal it. This really happened. It was led by a man called Clements Markham, and he really did take some botanists on the expedition. Merrick is fictional, but he goes on that expedition. And when he gets to Peru, he finds that he has a very peculiar history there, all of his own. I'm here to talk to you today, really, about three of my favorite books ever. The first one is called Dark Matter. It's by a brilliant writer called Michelle Paver. It's actually my favourite ghost story. It follows an expedition of five men up to one of the islands near Svalbard uh, off the coast of Norway, Spitsbergen. It takes place in 1937 and the five men are out to set up a weather station. But very early things start going wrong. They arrive just on the edge of winter and all through the book the cold deepens and the dark deepens until eventually we have the long night of the Norwegian winter. They soon realise that they've set up quite close to a station where hunters used to skin seals to sell further south. And by this stage in the book, some kind of creepiness is already happening. Some members of the expedition are showing a kind of peculiar and really sinister bloodlust. So stuff is already going wrong by this point. But if an abandoned sealing station isn't creepy enough with all the flensing knives and chains still out, along with all the bones, they realise as well that this is the site where a man was killed and left to die. He's, we don't really know very much about him. He's a loner, but he was killed out here, we think, by the sealers. And soon after they realise this, something starts to follow them. A figure who doesn't belong with them, who approaches off the ice. And through the book, it gets closer and closer and closer. Standard ghost story. But what I love about this book is the structure. There's a countdown. You start out with five expeditionaries, and then one by one, they drop away. And I love that, because as soon as you can get any kind of countdown or clog into a ghost story, it's great because it really ratchets up the tension. And I think even if you don't notice at the front of your mind that that's what's going on, there's a little part of you that's going, what happens when we get to one? And it all builds up to what happens when we get to one. Because there are five people in this rather than 10 like there are in the, and then there were none, you really care about all of them. You get to know them very, very fast. So the emotional stakes are really high, especially by the time the second to last character leaves. His name is Gus. And the narrator of this, Jack, has fallen in love with him hard, which means that it's this kind of terrible emotional moment when he leaves and Jack is left alone on the ice with this thing. Please read it, it is absolutely wonderful. So this is book two on my list of my favorite books. Um, I don't think Neil Gaiman needs any introduction, but I just wanted to give Anansi Boys a shout out. This is about one of the characters who appears in American Gods, the African spider god, Anansi. Now, in the book, Anansi is brilliant. He is a singing, dancing, swaggering, green hat wearing man with enough pizzazz to charm the entire cancer ward where his wife is staying. Now, it's not really about Anansi. As the title implies, it's about his sons. And in the main, one son. The son's name is Fat Charlie. 
and he's everything that a Nancy is not. But he's not fat. The trouble is that a Nancy called him that once, and what a Nancy says has an awful way of sort of sticking to you. So he's always been Fat Charlie. He's unremarkable and he works at a talent agency in London for a really oily boss. But suddenly, his older brother Spider bursts into his life in all his amazing glory. Spider got the God side of things from Anansi. Spider is confident, he's brilliant at singing, he's really good at getting drunk without like having a horrible hangover, which again, Fat Charlie is not. And soon he takes over Fat Charlie's life completely, from his flat to his fiancée, Rosie, who is the only brilliant thing in Fat Charlie's life. And desperate, Fat Charlie makes a deal with an ancient god to get rid of Spider. Of course it goes horribly wrong, and most of the book is about coming to terms with Spider and getting out of this very ill-considered deal. Now, I love this book because it writes, it's, it's all about people who are not the writer. Neil Gaiman is white, and I think it's easy to, to feel very uncomfortable when you read a book by a white writer about people of colour. And I think um, very quickly you think of, of phrases like cultural appropriation. And I'm white, so I don't get to have an opinion about that. But I think that one of the grand endeavours of fiction is to write about who you're not. I think that women should write about men and men should write about women and young people should write about older people and vice versa and all the possible cultural fissures that we have. I think it's about understanding people who are not you. And if we didn't do that, we'd all end up writing this awful kind of inward-turning, self-centred autobiography. Um, and Neil Gaiman is the absolute opposite of that. So I do hope you give it a go if you've not seen it before. Okay, so this is my third and favourite book of all of the ones I've shown you so far. This is Fool's Errand by Robin Hobb. It's about a man called Fitz, and he was born a royal bastard, which means that he's always been involved on the kind of shadier side of court life. But in this book, he's managed to escape all that, and he's carved out a little life for himself in a village. His problem is that he has a kind of far-reaching telepathy, and in the book it's called The Skill. He can hear snatches of conversation, of song, of feelings across hundreds of miles. And of course, this gift means that he's very valuable to the royal family, but he doesn't see it as a gift at all. For him, it's more like an addiction. And if he falls too far into it, he is very much at risk of losing himself in the flow of the magic and leaving his body behind as a kind of breathing vegetable. So this is really dangerous for him, and he doesn't want to go anywhere near that life again. At the start of the book, his old teacher turns up and tries to persuade him to go back, and of course Fitz refuses because it's a terrible idea. But then, someone else comes too, someone who Fitz never thought he would see again. And it's his childhood friend, The Fool. The Fool is the reason I love this book. He is funny, he's mysterious, and he's non-binary. Fitz sees him as a man, but actually The Fool is just one of several alter egos this person has, and another is a very beautiful woman called Amber, and he goes through several of them all through this, the course of the books. You never quite know where he comes from or even what he is, um, certainly not human. And he's just an absolute delight to read. What we do know about him is that he's a prophet, and he sees multiple futures all the time. And he sees it as his duty in the world to steer time down the path he thinks it should go. Namely, the path where dragons do not go extinct. And that is the theme that links the whole trilogy from this book onwards. Even though it is about, you know, dragons and magic, the real heart of this book is Fitz's relationship with the fool um, and their friendship and the things they do for each other and to each other, actually. And... This is the most marvellous introduction to Robin Hobb, but in the second book in this trilogy, Fitz and the Fool have an amazing row that starts off with just a slightly misplaced simile about straw, and it is actually the best fictional exploration of the fracturing of a friendship along its fault lines that I've ever read. Please do give this a go if you haven't heard of Robin Hobb before.